Well, friends, thank you for joining us for part three, Strangulation, What We Have Learned in 2019. Our original goal was to have this done in one session, and then it became two sessions, and now we are in our third session because uh, Gail Strack is an overachiever, and uh, we just have a lot to talk about. So I'm Casey Gwynn, the president of Alliance for Hope International. We're very honored to have you joining us today. Uh, Gail Strack is my co-host uh, for this webinar. Uh, Gail is the founder of the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention and the CEO of Alliance for Hope International and really our leader in all of this. We're also very honored to have Dr. Bill Smock and Lieutenant Dan Rincon and Diana Favno joining us for uh, part three uh, as they have been involved uh, in part one and part two as well. This webinar is really designed to be an advanced webinar for those that have attended our four-day course and or other courses on near and non-fatal strangulation assaults around the country. Part one of this webinar really focused on context, looking at uh, issues like lethality and some of the history and really helping to set the framework for why we are advocating so aggressively uh, for the handling and focus on near and non-fatal strangulation assault. Part two shifted into talking about the law and spent a lot of time on medical. Uh, and now in part three, we're gonna wrap up talking about uh, forensic uh, medical examination and issues around the importance of uh, domestic violence examinations uh, in these cases of near and non-fatal strangulation. And then we're going to talk about a little bit about investigation. We're going to talk a little bit more about medical. We're going to talk about prosecution. We're going to talk about advocacy. Uh, so there's just kind of a whole bunch of topics that we will touch on here uh, in part three of this webinar. We're very honored uh, to have this webinar sponsored by the Office of Violence Against Women and the work that we do with OBW uh, in the U.S. Department of Justice uh, around the handling of near and non-fatal strangulation cases. Special thanks to Laura Rogers and to our program manager, Kevin Sweeney. Um, the Training Institute is the umbrella for this work across the country. The Training Institute is a program of our larger organization, Alliance for Hope uh, International. So we're going to dive right in uh, to part three. And Diana, thanks for uh, sticking with us and uh, joining us on, on part three as we talk a little bit about medical examination and clinical documentation, not so much from uh, a step-by-step -step standpoint, but really more about what our domestic violence exam committee is doing and learning and uh, focused on. Uh, so thanks for joining us, Diana, and starting us off in part three. Thanks for having me again. Um, well, uh, last year, actually a year and a half ago, maybe, uh, we were in San Diego at the master's course. And as you look at the names of the people on this committee, uh, we all were very excited to um, look forward and think about a certification in strangulation. So we began the work of uh, looking at guidelines that would assist uh, medical people in training or providing training for strangulation. And those were the members of that committee. So we currently are still active in working on the strangulation guidelines. Um, these guidelines will augment the four-day strangulation advanced training. We're not there to repeat things, uh, but to do a deeper dive into the medical. So it will be the precursor for certification. So please watch for more information this next year to come out on this. So um, certification process will be handled by the Forensic Nurse Certification Board um, who will select the testing questions, how the exam will be administered and who can qualify for that exam. So there's a lot of unknowns yet there because I'm not part of that certification committee, uh, but the other committee. So the goal is to provide certification for those nurse examiners and other providers who want that uh, certificate of certification to help them probably testify in court as an expert uh, when they're called upon to review cases and different things like that. So it will be a little niche for the certification with this. And talk a little bit uh, with us about uh, the Academy of Forensic Nursing. Obviously, we're very excited uh, to nationally be partnering with you all. 
um, as uh, AFN develops. Uh, um, many of you obviously being involved for many years with the International Association of uh, Forensic Nurses, but now uh, beginning to develop this uh, academy. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on with AFN? Yes, and the Academy is so excited to uh, have the Alliance for Hope as one of our partners. Um, it just means so much to have a partner that we have similar missions and visions um, about the work that we do in our organizations. So that's one of the exciting things. Um, we're going to share uh, media uh, items as we can. Certainly, uh, it's easy to um, go to Facebook and add things. I always encourage our Facebook to put up trainings that are important, such as the Strangulation Institute. So please watch for a lot of that for us. We do have trainings coming up and probably uh, the next one <clears throat> is specifically on elder abuse in Anaheim at the American Academy of Forensic Science. But the one that I'm looking forward to is the uh, cruise out of Miami, Advancing the Footprint at Sea. It's a three-day cruise, March 20th through the 21st. And Casey is one of our um, keynote speakers at that conference. So very excited to um, hear your talk again on HOPE. Um, we've got other trainings coming up, uh, Photography boot camp in Georgia, Advancing the Footprint, two in Indianapolis. So those are just some of the things that will be coming up. Uh, lots of opportunities for members to participate. Um, and that's, um, that's what we uh, have on the radar so far this year. That's great. As you look forward, as you look forward with the Academy uh, five years from now, what, what do you see? Where would you like to be uh, as you're kind of developing these new initiatives and new focus areas, particularly around domestic violence and strangulation? Uh, five years from now, looking, looking forward with the Academy, I definitely want to see that micro certification for strangulation. I would like to see the training, the information embedded in the institutes of higher learning, whether that's at the bachelor level for the nurse, uh, because they are the boots on the ground um, or advanced practice so that everyone coming out in the future has an understanding about strangulation, uh, the potential dangers and lethality. And you know, I think Diana, let me know if I'm wrong. I remember you even had a dream that victims and patients would know which hospitals would be educated in strangulation. Do you remember that conversation? Oh, of course I do. Um, that was the strangulation friendly hospital logo. So that, that. hospitals, <clears throat> hospitals who have uh, adopted the protocols and the guidelines would be able to put that on their front doorstep so that the community knew that if something happened and they were strangled, that is the hospital I want to go to. Which I thought was a clever idea because maybe we can't get to the brain clinic right now, but this is similar to that, that this hospital and everybody that works there is knowledgeable about anoxic brain injury in every kind of form. That's right. And that would include their stroke team, just as Dr. Smock discussed, uh, asking all those uh, uh, patients who are under 35 if they've ever been strangled. That's great. Well, we're excited about this journey uh, for sure uh, with the Academy and obviously appreciate your passion and focus. Uh, we have felt for many, many years that the domestic violence uh, world uh, needs forensic nurses in a much more systematic way uh, when we created what really was the first uh, domestic violence focused forensic unit in the country at the San Diego Family Justice Center. We felt very passionately about it then uh, we didn't see it so much as bringing sexual assault into domestic violence as we saw it just building forensic expertise around domestic violence. But uh, you and many others in the forensic nursing world have really taken this lead in saying sexual assault 
uh, examiners need to expand their practice and we don't need to create something completely separate. We just got to develop a much a broader approach uh, using forensic nurses that already have so much of this forensic expertise. So we very much appreciate that. I do want to just briefly talk about um, alternative light source. I know uh, you're helping to support this uh, conference and I'm going to ask Bill to comment on this. This has been a big issue in 2019 is beginning to think about uh, the significance of alternate light source uh, photography, uh, both in sexual assault and in domestic violence, and particularly in strangulation? Sure. Um, there still is not a lot of research out there that points to that you can use the alternate light source or negative inverted photographs to definitely say that that definitely is a bruise um, in that picture. So we're still cautious. And um, what we go on is if we see an injury, if we see a bruise, if we feel uh, that the area is swollen or they pull away from pain, that there is an injury there. And sometimes we can see it uh, by that technology. So again, it's with the word of caution, go ahead and use it, uh, but understand that you can't uh, put your hat on and swear by it. I think if you find an area that's tender, that is indicative, and there's a history that supports evidence of trauma to a certain area, use the your regular photography, your ALS photography, and then do follow-up exams. If that if there is bleeding under the tissue and it comes to the surface 24, 48, 72 hours later, then that supports that the ALS picked it up before it was visible externally with normal light. So um, I think as the research goes forward, there will be a role for ALS. Um, but just be careful because there are things that will show up under the skin with ALS that are not bruises. And that's where you have to be very careful. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to say that that is, with a reasonable degree of medical and scientific certainty, a bruise? And have you ruled out other potential things that may be under the skin, like a birthmark or some sort of vascular issue that was pre-existing unrelated to the assault. So that's where the research needs to go, and I think is going, and there's some good work being done out there, some good research, so more to come. Thank, Thank you. you for touching on that. And Diana, I'd love you to talk a little bit about, you know, obviously we are not just focused on domestic violence at the Institute, we're also focused on sexual assault and its relationship to strangulation. Certainly, I think if you go back 10, 15 years, uh, strangulation and suffocation were mostly being missed in sexual assault cases because that wasn't the focus of the exam. It's barely been touched on in, in protocols. Uh, but the newest research is definitely causing us to pay far more attention in this relationship between sexual assault and strangulation. Absolutely. And, you know, years ago, those words weren't even on the form if they had a form to fill out versus just a lab report checking the box of what you collected. So this little study, it is short, um, but they saw a lot of cases and they found that, uh, of course, with sexual assault, there is the non-fatal strangulation. Most victims were female, uh, more common with a partner. Um, than it was with strangers. But this is the item that caught my eye. The non-fatal strangulation occurred more often when weapons were involved in anal penetration. So again, that just speaks to the level um, that the perpetrator is using on the victim here uh, with the anal penetration and weapons. So it's, um, so I'll just leave it at that. So the conclusion was, um, that we need to be aware, the sexual assault nurse examiners need to be aware of a heightened risk of lethality, and they need to screen for the non-fatal strangulation when there's a report of sexual assault. So great study. Yeah, I, I do say, and I, this is a slide that, you know, Gail's been tracking some of this research around the relationship of the prevalence of near and non-fatal strangulation and positional asphyxia probably needs to be put in there too, which I'm asked Bill to touch on. But I do think the numbers are probably higher than that, uh, than that study that we just talked about. Um, I, uh, 
you know, depends on the study you look at, but the more you talk to a sexual assault survivor about altered state of consciousness, if it is not a drug facilitated sexual assault and the survivor has any altered state of consciousness, they may not even know that they've been strangled uh, or suffocated. Uh, during the assault. So I do think this is a really important focus area for us to continue to dialogue with sexual assault nurse examiners about. Uh, and I tend to think that over time, we're going to find that the number of sexual assault victims that have experienced strangulation and or suffocation uh, is actually higher than what some of these early studies are showing. I agree. And the other issue here is they don't know the words to say because the victim doesn't know, even know that they have been strangled, as you mentioned. So it's really, really important. Bill, did you just want to make a comment on that? No, I think the asking those questions about pressure being applied to the neck, uh, visual changes, auditory changes should be part of every sexual assault exam so that we don't miss those clues when they may not remember what happened or they aren't going to disclose that they were choked uh, mm -hmm. during the uh, event. We did an early, uh, when we were uh, developing the Family Justice Center in Los Angeles, the first Family Justice Center, it's called Strength United, led by an amazing a woman, Kim Roth, and it came out of a sexual assault response team. It really morphed into a collaborative, multi-agency uh, Family Justice Center framework. And early on, we had the opportunity to, to review uh, some redacted um, sexual assault uh, nurse examiner reports uh, in some cases. And I will tell you that uh, early on, those nurses were saying, we don't see sexual assault and strangulation together very often. And we, when we did the analysis of the reports, we found signs and symptoms of 40% of the sexual assault re reports, even though they didn't identify the strangulation. And as you know, Bill, they weren't asking about it. That actually was not part of their protocol to ask about pressure to the neck or pressure to the chest, even if the rapist was sitting on top of her, uh, that wasn't a focus area. And so that signs and symptomology of 40% to me is still a very significant number when we see some of this research coming out. So thank you for both kind of continuing to raise issues and uh, to talk about this. I think it's uh, really important uh, because when you put, start putting these things together between what the victim is saying or what the police officer is documenting we're going to find that it, it's probably higher than anything that we've seen in published research yet. I don't know if either one of you want to comment on this. Actually, I do. Uh, that was actually one of the questions that we asked the practitioners. And we've been asking the practitioners, well, what do you think? And in the field, what I've been hearing, uh, especially from those that are specially trained in strangulation, they're aware of the clues to look for, what to listen for. Um, they project that these numbers of sexual assault and strangulation is much higher than what the research is showing. So I think between the article and the, the survey results, it's going to vary until we get more education and awareness out there. And Diana, you made a very important point, forms. Uh, I learned many years ago from Ellen Pence, everything is driven by forms. So if there's not a box on the form, it's as if it didn't exist. So if your form doesn't even include choking, strangulation, pressure to the neck, it's definitely going to be missed. So I predict that as we continue to learn and evolve in this field, we're going to see higher numbers of strangulation and suffocation in sexual assault cases. And obviously, uh, Dan, it means that law enforcement has to be doing this in their sexual assault investigations too, asking about pressure to the neck, uh, asking if the perpetrator at any point was on top of them that made it difficult for them to breathe. Th those pieces I don't think have been asked very much either at the, at the investigation stage. I don't know if you would agree with that, but we still need to focus there with law enforcement in the initial investigation, even before the forensic exam. I would agree with that. That it's something that we uh, noticed earlier on, and we've been uh, taking progressive steps to make that part of sexual assault investigations also. Well, thank you all for talking about that and just touching on it. Thank you, uh, Diana, to you and the entire committee and both doctors and nurses that have involved in thinking about uh, medical forensic exams in domestic violence, without a doubt, this needs to be a focus area going forward, and we really have failed 
uh, victims of domestic violence and offering them uh, in general forensic exams, not just in strangulation, but really uh, in all domestic violence, but certainly the more life-threatening injuries that are going to be missed are usually going to be strangulation related. Uh, one of the reasons we're including this slide, it's under the category of buried treasure. So about a year ago, Dan and I were dreaming and talking, and we were wondering how much the field has expanded from sexual assault nurses taking their practice and expanding it to include domestic violence exams. And Diana, with her colleague and network, were able to do a quick survey with 100 uh, responses. So I don't know, Diana, do you want to share a little bit more about this one? Sure. Actually, um, <clears throat> this survey, um, Linda LaDre, the SART SANE website, it went out as a survey monkey on that website. So we did have a good response that came back. And uh, there were 100 responses. And I was surprised it was this high. 69% of them said that they conducted strangulation assessments. So that was uh, very hopeful. <laughs> and that was good news. That, that's good news for our training. And the other thing we wanted to share is we need your help. Uh, we're trying to really get our arms around how many states or counties are doing domestic violence exams that also include strangulation assessments. So actually this is a good time to write into your chat feature. And if you're not included on this list, please let us know about you and what you're doing. Tell us your county and your state and we would love to follow up. So uh, Diana, some great work has been happening in Utah. Yes, and this comes from Kristen Hall and the Family Justice Center work in Salt Lake City. Um, she helped uh, push off uh, a huge training to the paramedics and EMT providers in Salt Lake City. So this just helped them establish their workflow uh, process of how the victim was going to be seen when identified who was going to be touching them and where they were going to go. And Utah is one of those communities that has a, a very um, wonderful district attorney. Uh, we really love him. He was, he really took the lead on the Family Justice Center when it was still a dream. And he has embraced the strangulation prosecution being really aggressive. And I think a thing that we're seeing across the United States the communities that have already the multidisciplinary teams, the communities that have a family justice center, they're really poised to take what they already have and expand their response. And I really love the chart um, that was put together on how they can streamline the process for survivors. So thank you for sharing this. And as we go, we wanna now share a little more work about the work matters. And uh, Diana, you most recently with Dr. Bill Smock and Michelle Shores, who's like a local hero here in San Diego, did a whole session webinar on conducting the clinical forensic non-fatal strangulation examination. And we just wanted you to highlight uh, some of the results from San Diego. And then we want to go into some of the resources that if we have folks here who are thinking about expanding their scope of practice, what things can they take a look at uh, to do exactly that? Sure. <clears throat> um, this work, uh, certainly a hat off to Michelle Shores and her group. They were able to uh, see patients at the Family Justice Center in San Diego, and they quickly found out that they weren't asking the right questions uh, or that the patients couldn't answer that question. Um, were you strangled? So um, they concluded that it was important to use other words, such as, did anything touch your face? Did anything go over your face? Were you choked? So those words were important. And part of the uh, results from that is that there's increased documentation so that the district attorney could take these cases forward. And this slide just speaks to the issue, issue rates um, and how 
when you had a domestic violence uh, DV exam strangulation, um, your uh, processing rates go up and uh, the plead rate goes up as well. So it just yeah, shows you know, when you put all the things together, you have a success. Yeah, the data from Michelle's on the prosecution uh, and the conviction rate uh, when they do a, a DAFI exam was up to, if you took misdemeanor and felonies, it was 95%. And when I share that data with prosecutors around the country, what prosecutor would not want a 95% conviction rate when it comes to non-fatal strangulation? That's incredible. And Michelle has done some fantastic work there in San Diego. Yes, and we wanted to showcase that. And I think the point I would like to highlight that it has been a complete team effort. And uh, San Diego Police Department in particular, they routinely will send their police officers and detectives to training. They've included strangulation training in the academy, advanced officer training, and everybody goes through the advanced course. And Tracy Pryor and Kurt Meckles have done the same. They are always sending their prosecutors to the advanced course. Because as we heard from part one, I believe, where Dan was saying how important it is to keep training, retraining, and training again. Because people do get moved around, whether in the police department or the district attorney's office or in other organizations. So now we want to talk about resources. Going back to like the beginning, uh, one of the first published articles, even though I think all of us have been dreaming about this for many years, it was published in the Journal of Emergency Medicine in 2001 when Dr. Uh, George McLean, Dr. Dean Hawley, Ellen Tulliver, and others said, well, what could it look like? What could the protocol of care for the strangled victim look like? And it's been a very long journey to get to where we are. And speaking of where we are, the next article that uh, really highlights the strangulation forensic examination came out in 2013. And Diana, you're the lead author. Yes, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> Why did you that was a long, that? long time ago, but um, the point was to put a case forward and to talk about the case history and what happened to this uh, lady who had been strangled and what all the pieces might be if there uh, was a team to work around her. Fantastic. And you were also one of the leaders when we all worked together to create the non-fatal strangulation documentation toolkit. Can you share a little bit more there? Yes, that was a committee uh, out of the International Forensic Nurses Association um, that we all signed up for to work on. Uh, so there were different products that came from this that went into the toolkit. It had to do with uh, a documentation form, uh, protocol, photography, and different, different things in the toolkit. And the purpose of the toolkit was to be posted on the website so that anyone could download it and not be charged for it. That was a couple years ago. Um, I think that's it. Oh yes, the members. Uh, a lot of these members are AFN members, Barb Bachmeyer, Divot Lynch, Ruth Downing, Annie Lewis O'Connor, um, of course, Dr. Smock, Gail Strack, Sally Sturgeon, um, are just some of the group that really worked hard on this and put forward. It was a lot of time um, and effort. These forms, documentation forms that are up right now are currently the domestic violence forms and these are found on the uh, California Forensic Medical Training site. You can download this form for free and this is specifically for domestic violence it is seven to eight pages long. This is a great one. Uh, this is the workbook, uh, the Manual Non-Fatal fatal Strangulation Assessment Workbook for Healthcare Providers and First Responders. So in this workbook are cases, actual case studies uh, that make you go through a process of identifying anatomy, identifying injury, and then talking about what you're gonna do for treatment and discharge planning. So we currently are working on upgrading this workbook. So there will be different cases in it. 
We've included uh, some domestic violence exams information in this as well. So look for that to come out in about three to four months. I also like this before. It was kind of like buried treasure when I go through my emails. It came out in 2017, discovered in 2018, and I don't think we've been sharing this research, but in plain English, the authors put together what every nurse needs to know and recognize about strangulation. So it's a really good tool, I think, for attendees who are watching this to make sure it gets out to your community, especially if you're a community that has not been addressing it. So Casey, Diana's gonna go through. I love this. This was uh, a dream and thank you, Diana, for pulling this together and making it accessible to others. But please tell folks more about this because this is central to our uh, helping victims. Yes, um, this we titled this the safety kit, which is specifically for non-fatal strangulation, targeting uh, child <clears throat> advocacy centers that a lot of times don't have the tools or evidence collection kits should they have a child come in who had been strangled. So in the kit is directions, uh, some swabs, right, left, neck, fingernails, and a buckle that are easy to collect with the directions. You can put them back in the envelope, seal the envelope, the chain of uh, custody is on the front, and sign this over to law enforcement in one swoop. So you can uh, uh, purchase these and that information is on this slide if that's something you're interested in, or you can make your own kit. So swabbing of the neck is important. And I always use those swabs, you know, we do double duty, if you will. You wanna touch that neck. And I always say, if that hurts or you're having any pain, let me know. So if they pull away when you touch and they complain of pain, that's a pretty good indicator that you would document that on your form. The hands are really important, always the hands. We wanna look for any injuries, any broken nails, um, or even if they have fingernails, period. So I always encourage in the photograph uh, documentation protocol that you do take a picture of those hands. This is just an example of a broken fingernail that happened in a struggle, pretty clear. And of course, everything is done. We wanna do trauma-informed care. And the other thing that I noticed in doing the uh, strangulation exams is when I would hand, hand them a styrofoam head, not all the patients, but uh, a number of them became very agitated when I asked them to put their <clears throat> hands on the neck. Um, and so I thought about that and I thought, what if we just had some pictures of uh, maybe a dummy with different hands on the neck in different positions? So we call this an eight pack and it clearly gives you eight pictures with eight positions of the hands on the neck that uh, the patient can look at put her finger on whichever one it is without covering up the number, and you can take a picture of it and add it to your documentation. This is the example, and you can download that at sdfi.com. <coughs> so this was just an example. The other important piece is to have a standardized discharge information instructions for your patients. We all have standardized instructions from our emergency rooms, but something very specific from the forensic piece that addresses the strangulation suffocation. The Strangulation Institute has this form. They have the link here and you can download it. Just again, thank you, Diana. I remember when I first reached out to you, probably 1995 and asked you some very silly questions and what we can do to improve our documentation of strangulation cases. And I don't know if you remember, but I think I asked you what, if we could use the blue dye on a victim's neck to see if we can identify some of those injuries. And uh, you were so kind and sweet. You didn't laugh at me, but you educated me. And I think that's what this is all about. 
So speaking about education, we got Lieutenant Dan Rincon here, and he's going to walk us through some of the things that we are learning in the area of investigation, some new tips and some new projects that are in the work. He is leading our law enforcement committee along with Jerry Feynman, and we're really excited about the law enforcement and legal committee. They've been pretty active. And uh, we just want to encourage everybody to go to our website. One quick thing everybody can do to start turning everything around is to try to get your first responders to take this 30-minute online course that was in partnership with the Pennsylvania State Troopers Association and the Pennsylvania Coalition Against Domestic Violence. They received an awesome grant to do this online course, and it's just really awesome. It's been post-certified in two states, very professionally done. We negotiated to make this available for free to everyone right off our website. What's so cool about it is you take this online course, you take a test, and if you pass, you will get a certification that you pass that you can give to your supervisor. We have challenged police chiefs and other leaders around the United States to encourage their entire staff to take it. And we're documenting about 6,000 uh, attendees who will take this online course. So that's like the first step uh, to move forward on this. I don't know, have you done that uh, with your folks, Dan? We are continuous trying to do training uh, on, on a smaller level, yes, uh, on a larger level with Arizona Post uh, is, is preferred and uh, that's being worked on uh, over the last couple of months. Regarding investigations, some of the things that we've been looking at in general, some of these are on slides ahead, so I'll, I'll go over them quickly now, uh, where the, inc the increase of questions related to the ability to breathe. Uh, we found that just asking that they were able to breathe left many doors open, as we stated earlier, that one is going to one one might be able to breathe even though they are being strangled, but their uh, circulation is clearly being impeded uh, all the way up, up to and including uh, consciousness. Regarding the uh, IACP domestic violence uh, policy uh, model, we've had improvements uh, recently uh, with the IACP broadening the scope of the model, uh, including uh, EMS uh, requesting of the victim. Uh, when we are dealing with our victims, when we're talking to them, they're under a lot of stress and trauma. They Sometimes the obvious is right there and calling EMS to make sure they're safe is something that uh, needs to take place and is part of this protocol. Uh, and we need to have these types of updates related to our protocols as far as our victims. We're also... Uh, Actually, with Gail and Mike, Detective Mike Agnew, uh, Detective Joshua Helton, and Bill Hernandez in California are enhancing the investigations chapter on our protocols, investigative protocols. Again, it just gives a clear uh, roadmap for investigators, both in uh, first responders and detectives alike, to have a, me a methodology of investigating these crimes so that we're not leaving, leaving any stone unturned as far as investigative sense. So the, again, the more comprehensive case we make, the more successful we are going to be. And again, with evidence-based prosecution, we've got to go in with the mindset like a homicide. We're not expecting uh, a victim in a homicide to testify, nor should we expect a victim in a domestic violence strangulation to testify. Breathing questions, there was a, we had a little shortcoming with that in the sense of just asking, could you breathe? didn't really answer all the different questions as we stated earlier uh, with Bill Smock and, and Gail and Casey talking about that we can put pressure to the neck and someone would be able to breathe. Uh, they'd be able to talk possibly. Uh, so to ask these questions individually really helps in the scope of tailoring what happened to the victim to the laws that are created, the, the laws that we have on the books so that the uh, prosecutors have a better understanding of what happened and can articulate uh, their case in court more effectively. We talk about, you know, what is happening? What did you feel was happening to you? Are you having any trouble breathing now? So we show something in the aspect of post, uh, post the incident. Uh, is it different than before? Again, trying to articulate, are there any differences we haven't met these people potentially. We don't know what they sounded like before. 
We only have what is happening now. And as we go through this investigation, it can even change over the course of an hour or two that we might be with that victim. And noting those changes are very important. Looking at scales from one to zero and pain scales. Uh, the new pocket guide from New York uh, is, again, with anything that can fit in the shirt pocket for a police officer, we all know, and we all have those types of cards, having the ability to have quick and easy access to get information, investigative information to officers is, is paramount. We do with so many other types of investigations, and uh, these types of cards will definitely help in the field. Our law enforcement committee is very robust, as you can see, uh, and legal committee. I'm privileged to serve as a co-chair along with uh, Jerry Feynman out of Riverside. And I will tell you that there is a lot of interaction. Uh, the participation is great. I thank them all for uh, being a part of the group and interacting. And together, it's, it's definitely making a difference for all of us to gr continuously grow and learn. Regarding our... Uh, projects. We have trial briefs and, and laws. We've touched uh, on those earlier on. Uh, strangulation supplemental forms. Uh, there are many of them out there, and our goal is to really create the uh, best practices when it comes to these forms, asking the right questions uh, that really uh, assist, in, regardless of how the law is written in each state, that it will help an investigator holistically uh, with these uh, types of investigations, keeping in mind that a, a, a supplemental form is uh, not a replacement for a good narrative, but more of a uh, investigative cue for someone to ask questions that they might have otherwise forgotten. Our roll call videos are part of that also. So I'm excited to share that we came up with a new sentencing brief, turned out to be a little weekend project. Uh, when we were working with a survivor who really needed our help as the case was going for a sentencing hearing, but neither the prosecutor or the judge or anyone that was really involved in the case really knew much about strangulation. So I just want folks to know that we had a chance to provide you with a new resource. It also includes an affidavit from Dr. Bill Smock that was introduced at the sentencing hearing. I don't know if we got the results we really wanted, but at the end of the day, it gave us an opportunity to educate. And so dream big, start small is what we always say. It's not in our resource library currently. It's going to be available by request. Uh, Dan also mentioned the roll call videos. We're working on kind of an update of one, but we do have one available that we put out in 2019. It's uh, nine and a half minutes and is available currently uh, off of YouTube. Uh, for law enforcement agencies. Uh, we had a contract with the Colorado uh, State Attorney General to initially do a roll call video for Colorado law enforcement, and then we edited that video. Michael Burke uh, and Gail and Bill Smock and our whole team uh, worked on it, and so there now is a roll call video that is available for download and, and use anywhere in the country. We've kind of made it generic so it doesn't focus particularly on Colorado. Um, and Dan and uh, the law enforcement team are also looking to create a more updated uh, version of this, but this is a resource uh, now for you as well. And we've come a long way when it comes to specialized documentation forms. And Dan, if you can tell us what your committee is doing right now, I know we spent a lot of time just pulling it all together, and San Diego did one, which represents probably the newest strangulation form in our resource library, but your team is going even deeper. Tell us more about that. Yes, um, we have a lot of forms, a lot of great forms out there, no, uh, no doubt about it, but uh, what we wanted to create is uh, a form that can adapt to the best practices. We understand that uh, we are going to continue to grow. There's going to be questions that we may not be asking today that we will need to ask tomorrow. And the idea was to create a baseline form, taking into account all of the great forms that are out there and trying to condense it into one form that, that really takes the best out of all the forms that are out there. And again, again allow us to continuously grow with it. Uh, the San Diego form is an outstanding form, uh, and we're blending it with... Uh, 
the Oklahoma form, the Maricopa County, the uh, all the form. There's so many out there to list, but we we had the entire committee has really take a look at all of them, and from our uh, opinion, both from a law enforcement and a prosecutor view, uh, are looking at the questions that we feel are the most significant, the most important that uh, can help in the success uh, of an investigator being able to be prompted to ensure that they are asking all of the required questions that is that is going to uh, allow us to be successful in our investigations. That's great. Thanks, Dan. I do also want to highlight uh, this last year, we have become more and more kind of aggressive in talking about the importance of crime scene investigation and getting crime scene investigators, uh, CSI folks out to the scene of strangulation assaults so few jurisdictions are doing this and if they if they don't roll on these cases assuming oh it's just a misdemeanor there's not many, very much visible injury in many cases they're missing attempted murder cases and there should be no difference in crime scene response between somebody being stabbed in the chest and somebody being strangled almost to death uh, and the need to work that scene we were inspired uh, this last year by <clears throat> a team out of uh, charlotte north carolina led by a, a career law enforcement officer named Catherine Scheinreich, um, who really built one of the most significant crime scene units in the country with non-sworn personnel being trained to go out and investigate crime scenes. We also <clears throat> were blessed by the involvement of Joe Berner from the San Diego Police Department, who basically said exactly what Dan just said. If you treat every strangulation crime scene as a homicide, you will likely prevent one. And Early on, uh, crime scene was not rolling, even in San Diego, in any of these cases. And now crime scene specialists are rolling on these cases. And working this scene very often turns a case from a misdemeanor to a felony or a felony to an attempted murder case. So we're uh, very excited to continue pushing on that issue. Overall messaging of all this is we need better documentation. And there's so much evidence we're missing out there. Uh, yeah, I think you like this uh, oh. piece. Yes, uh, how I find out about new apps, it's the homework assignment for my law students. And so they found this one, and it's a new app that helps domestic violence victims document their abuse. Everyone on this particular webinar knows victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, and other crimes. And it's very difficult for them to report it. So knowing that there's an app out there is pretty cool. Uh, what I also had uh, Carly and Trish do was look them up just to find out a little bit more. So we found out that this app was created by a survivor for survivors. Uh, so take a look at it, play with it yourself, play with it with your clients to see what you think about it. We're gonna be doing the same with our Voices group. And uh, we hope by next year, our Voices members from Family Justice Centers will make their own pick about which apps they recommend to other survivors. We won't spend much time on this, but over the last year, we've been adding more and more to our four-day courses, and we'll be talking more about this at our next master's course, uh, really the expertise around interviewing victims with severe trauma, and uh, we've really been leaning on and relying on the work of Dr. David Lezak and Tom Tremblay and Becky Campbell at Michigan State, Russell Strand and others who are really thinking a lot about this trauma-informed experiential interviewing piece and done a lot of work around it. What does it mean to deal with victims when they can't even remember whether they lost consciousness or not? And how do we manage things like that when in fact all we've been doing is saying, did you lose consciousness? And they don't even know. And then we view that as a credibility issue. And in fact, the fact that they can't remember is actually evidence of the crime. So that's a continuing topic that we're obviously very interested in. Uh, we continue to use a video. Uh, we've played it all over the country this year. It's available for all of you that have attended our courses in our Dropbox um, accessed files. Uh, it's a video about trauma in the brain uh, from the UK. And we particularly like it because it's so simple and straightforward in talking about what it means to interview the traumatized victim and what trauma does to the brain, the physiology of that. Uh, Bill Smock's been doing a lot of work with us on that. He's now testifying in court on these issues of how trauma affects the brain uh, temporarily and in, uh, in significant cases permanently as well. And that data continues to play itself out. But we talked earlier about traumatic brain injury. Uh, we're seeing more and more evidence of, uh, of actually brain um, atrophy 
uh, happening in these cases. I don't know, Bill, if you want to just touch on that, but that's a big issue for us that I think we've probably been missing for a very long time. Yes. And most victims who uh, or, uh, undergo DV don't have our, any based on MRI, so we don't know what is actually happening. There is some uh, research out there that says when you are undergoing stress, life-threatening stress, for example, waterboarding is the best model that we have, that when the adrenal uh, glands secrete cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, that there is a physiologic impact to the cells of the brain, causing the brain to actually undergo cerebral atrophy, meaning the brain shrinks. So that is, and that's clear when it comes to victims who are tortured. And there is really physiologically no difference between someone who's undergoing DV. Uh, do you think you're going to die? Yes. Is your brain uh, being deprived of oxygen? Yes. And that's just exactly what happens physiologically when you're waterboarded. You can't breathe. You're drowning. You think you're going to die. And those impacts on the brain do have long-term consequences. And uh, the atrophy, the shrinking of the brain is one of those. And obviously very short-term consequences too, and that's why it's often difficult to be able to interview these victims. We do a lot of partnering with any Violence Against Women International and Joanne Archambault and her team. Uh, they just posted a number of, uh, of the webinars on forensic experiential trauma interviewing, uh, and I've listened to both those webinars. Uh, they're great. They've also uh, done some webinars on uh, ALS. Um, as well. So we wanted to highlight those webinars. They're available on Evaluate's website um, in their online resource library. Uh, and we like this new piece they've been doing. There's two parts to it on empathy-based suspect interviews, uh, which is just really taking kind of some of the principles of trauma-informed experiential interviewing and applying it in many ways to interviewing perpetrators of sexual and domestic violence including strangulation assault. So we wanted to give a quick shout out to Joanne and her team. And then Gail, you're gonna talk just a little bit about defenses. Right, uh, we're not gonna go through each and every one, but we think that the way to overcome and build stronger cases is definitely a good investigation. And a good investigation always starts with anticipating the defenses and how to overcome them. I think with a denial defense, we advocate for swabbing the hands and the neck, for self-defense, we're talking about talk to the defendants. Uh, so Casey kind of mentioned in the last slide, uh, what we're seeing is police officers for probably lots of different reasons may not be taking the opportunity to talk to the suspect and all witnesses involved. You can get a lot of great information there. Uh, our statistics are now at least a third of your defendants are probably gonna confess with a good interview. So think about that. What we did spend a lot of time this year is really talking about autoerotic asphyxia, consent, the rough sex defense. So we want to spend our time there. We did get a couple of cases where it was an accident, but the solution there is to really understand the medical research will not be covered now. And then ultimately what has been happening is did she commit suicide or was it a homicide? And we'll spend a few minutes there. But going forward, we wanted to come back to the consent defense for a number of reasons. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to have a little refresher and then an update. The law right now is very clear. You cannot consent to something that can cause a great bodily injury or that can kill you. One of the aha moments I had is when we were trying to pass our strangulation law in California, and the group that opposed this was this National Coalition for Sexual Freedom. I had no idea they even existed. Another the category, be careful what you Google, I Googled them and found uh, a whole community out there, and they also gave me a gift. When I went to their website, and I went specifically to pressure to the neck, I wanted to find out what do they say to all their members that are part of this community. And one of the first things I saw is that they made it very clear that the case law is clear that when it comes to this, this is still being considered a criminal assault and if it is brought to the attention of the police, they're going to pursue it as a criminal assault. And now you know we've got close to 50 states that have passed felony or some form of a felony strangulation law. Then as you continue to go on their website, they listed all these cases that as a matter of policy, uh, case after case and jurisdiction after jurisdiction for policy reasons, 
they did not want to find this as some sort of sexual behavior. And so a lot of these cases that have gone forward have been upheld on appeal. The other key point that we wanted to make is what is consent? So as I've been processing this information, I found this workbook that is really for sexual assault offenders. And one of the first pages that I opened up in this workbook, I kind of was drawn to it uh, for a number of reasons. One is in a hopeful path. And as you know, we are called the Lions for Hope. So I wanted to see what they're talking about. And I think it's something that we can incorporate, not only working with your offenders, but working with victims as well. They really kind of spelled it out as some of the issues about compliance, cooperation, coercion, force, and what is truly consent. And in my years of practice, we never went to this level of discussion. So we're going to be processing as a team and wanted to share that with you. The next slide, which we recommend is always knowing the law. This is a slide from Indiana. And Indiana is very clear. Yes, you can consent to sex. And there are things that you can't consent to. And it's very clear as to things that you can't. You'll see here the death results. You'll also see if batteries are atrocious or aggravated. And in the next slide, um, what I did for California, because I look at some of the research and the statistics when it comes to sexual assault, and I was kind of shocked as I started to really understand how little or how many how few cases are even prosecuted in sexual assault but when you look at sexual assault and strangulation uh, here's a case from 1944 that specifically said there was no consent for the victim to strangle so i encourage people that are on this call to look up some of your case law because you'd be surprised the law is definitely on your side and then in this case from indiana strangulation was viewed as deadly force in a rape case I thought was also extremely helpful. And that came out in 2015. And one of the things that I want to remind folks before they dismiss cases, when the defendant alleges that she consented to this, and unfortunately there was a young girl who was strangled to death, and these are predators. And so my point is the defendant must testify. In the cases that I've handled in the past, and the cases we're handling now, either on the civil side or through our justice project, uh, you got to usually it's the defendant who's coming up with this defense and the victim never mentions this so this is my dream cross-examination for when the defendant does testify how you could cross-examine him on this defense and what we're seeing this is the new trend that came out of our last two courses is there's research coming out a lot of cases are coming out things on social media where people who are being influenced by social media, being influenced by pornography, that we're seeing an increase of young teens and young adults who are kind of being pulled in by social media and they're dying. So these are just two recent cases where in the first case, I do believe it was uh, experimenting, but it got deadly. And the second case uh, where a victim ended up dying, but he also got prosecuted for murder. So. Uh, the warning is, and the point is, if you do this, please get called. Um, hopefully, your local prosecutors and investigators are coming after you. But I just wanted to show you a couple of memes, which I didn't even know existed. And we went kind of fast, so I'm going to ask Casey to back up one more. Uh, this is just two, and this is probably the uh, more sort of GP graded version as you can see here these are just two and this one says when he asks if you're sure you want him to choke you harder because he's worried that you might die you kind of have to wonder what is really out there and i'm just giving you two so just for those of you especially in the advocacy world i think we're going to be talking about this in our legal committee and in our group of what we can do to overcome this and the second slide is just another example of what we're seeing on social media. I don't need to read this one out loud, but what we're doing now at the Institute, and PC, you can go forward, we're creating our own means. Um, so this way, we as professionals who are working in this field can help educate. And one thing that really surprised me, we did our very first one with Casey's quote, and he had over 15,000 hits. 
And I wasn't into the social media response, but I think if, if we take this approach, we maybe, just maybe, minimize some of the risk that's happening to folks out there. The other piece that under defenses that we wanted to talk about, I'm gonna invite Dr. Bill Smock, because he's been our lead um, expert in this field and we've been handling a number of these cases. Could you share, Bill, some tips that you've learned now handling a number of these? Oh, uh, yes. And it goes back to uh, what I call basically cognitive bias on the part of either the investigator, that could be a detective, could be a coroner, a medical examiner, is that, oh, yeah, this is just another suicide. But are you really paying attention to the details of what physical evidence is there or isn't there? And uh, just doing a, a recent case in Missouri where uh, the victim was found dead in a hotel room. And the police initially were working it as a homicide, but then an investigator comes in and says, oh, no, this is a clear suicide. Well, the physical evidence supports that this was actually a staged scene, and there were injuries that weren't even documented uh, that's, uh, in the autopsy report, but are clearly evident on the photographs from the scene in the autopsy, which would indicate that this was not a suicide, but was in fact a staged uh, homicide, but missed because the investigators you know, think, oh yeah, it's just another suicide. So we really, if we approach every hanging uh, as a homicide till proven otherwise, then hopefully we won't miss some of those clues that would direct us uh, down a different path uh, to homicide rather than suicide. Some of these are extremely difficult. Do we have history? Do we have witnesses? Uh, so it, it really takes a team approach to figure out, is this in fact a suicide or is it a homicide Stage to look like a suicide. I really think that's the easiest way to get away with murder in this country is to you put a bicep and forearm on somebody's neck and you maintain pressure and you keep them there until they stop breathing and then you drag them into the closet and hook, uh, hang them up by a belt or a rope or an extension cord and you call 911. And it is going to be very easy to get away if you don't pay attention to those details of the location of the injuries. Why do I see a ligature mark here, but at autopsy, I find injuries you know, three or four or five inches below the area of the ligature. So it is, it's difficult, um, and it really takes a painstaking investigation. And we even have cases of people showing up in the ER still alive where, with a history of, oh, yeah, my wife committed suicide, when in fact uh, he was trying to kill her, hang her, uh, and made it look like a suicide. So um, hopefully we'll have more training on that, maybe even um, additional webinars and uh, educational opportunities to help investigators uh, look at those fine details. We'll direct your investigation down the path that needs to go. Well, thank you, Bill. And I, as, uh, as we wrap up this particular segment, um, this is just um, something that we have stumbled upon. We've been having a lot of families reach out to us. It's the opposite of the Innocence Project, but what has emerged are family members trying to get justice for their loved ones when they are convinced that they were killed and they did not commit suicide. So part of our legal team is that we are putting together some local and some experts across the country who are willing to volunteer their time to screen cases initially to determine if they're suspicious or not. So if you are working on a case where you know there was a history of domestic violence and all of a sudden there's a suspicious death, the only one that can get this to the autopsy room is probably you on this call to tell someone that this case is worthy of more attention and investigation. Having said that, now we're gonna move to prosecution. So friends, we have about 30 minutes left, so we're gonna move pretty fast in the wrap up of part three here. It's very difficult to cover all of this uh, in the course of just a couple of webinars. Uh, and that's why we have four day courses and three day courses and master's courses, but we'll touch on a few things and I may move quickly through these slides because this is not a training course. This is really an update for you of where we've been. Bottom line in this is we continue to push for the prosecution of near and non-fatal strangulation cases, even if the survivor is not able to participate. 
A recanting survivor is not a weakness in a domestic violence strangulation case. A recanting survivor in a strangulation assault uh, is acting rationally, is acting in what uh, she believes is a way to stay safe and stay alive. But the bottom line is that if we allow perpetrators uh, to intimidate their victims into uh, not participating and then we let the case go away, we have in essence just let a killer get away with it and there will eventually be a death. Uh, during uh, the preparation of this uh, webinar, stories began to break in New Orleans about the failure of the district attorney's office and the handling of strangulation cases and a stunning uh, dismissal rate uh, in misdemeanor domestic violence cases. And even though we are pushing for strangulation to be a felony, the reality is that strangulation is often still being prosecuted as a misdemeanor in a lot of the country. Uh, and when you're dismissing your misdemeanor domestic violence cases, again, you're giving uh, perpetrators a license to kill uh, down the road. So this uh, challenge for us in the prosecution world continues. It's very significant. We do have a couple of manuals. We have an Alaska manual that includes chapters on uh, children uh, impacted by pediatric strangulation, uh, elders and strangulation and suffocation and the role of advocacy. Uh, that's available uh, online uh, to all of you. We have a second edition of our California District Attorneys Association manual on investigating and prosecuting cases coming out. In fact, just as we were working on this webinar today, uh, the final edits came to us on the manual that Gail and I have been working on and have edited along with Bill and a lot of folks that have been involved from our institute. Um, at the end of the day, <clears throat> we are also seeing this battle raging around criminal justice and bail reform. And we are not at all hostile to uh, the work of criminal justice reform in trying to address challenges of mass incarceration. But at the end of the day, if we're letting dangerous, violent perpetrators have access again to their victims without accountability, um, that's not what true criminal justice reform is or bail reform. Uh, yes, innocent people need to be uh, exonerated, and yes, we need to make sure that because of the color of your skin or the size of your wallet, you do not end up in jail. But irrespective of the size of your wallet or the color of your skin, if you're a rage-filled, dangerous human being that's prone to kill other people, um, there has to be a consequence for that. Because if we simply go down the road of give them low bail, um, people die. Uh, women die, children die, uh, police officers die, as we talked about very early uh, in this webinar series, uh, police officers continue to die at very high rates across the country, most of whom are being killed by men who are uh, have a history of domestic violence, and many are being killed by men who are out on bail or who have uh, had access uh, to uh, legal services that has avoided accountability for them uh, for their offenses, and they end up killing uh, either uh, women, children, or police officers uh, in that process. And we certainly want to recognize um, Officer Gannon, who's, Sean Gannon was one of many of those officers in 2017, 2018, and 2019 who have died at the hands of stranglers. And the data continues, uh, even from the early years, the data continues to, to develop and expand. But the bottom line is that when perpetrators are reoffending and we're not increasing consequences and not holding them accountable, but we're going to face those kinds of impacts. And Gail's been tracking these cases across the country. We're not able to spend a lot of time on them now. There are so many, it's almost impossible to keep track. Well, it's overwhelming. I, I can't keep track. And so we're just highlighting a couple of stories that happened month after month. Even in today's Google alert, there was probably 10 uh, stories about this issue and all we wanted to do was to raise this to your level to pay attention to this and keep track locally and if you're not involved in the local task force that is addressing this invite yourself uh, because there's just too many cases as we said and I'm also seeing a new pattern Casey brought it up before but one thing I recently noted and I don't know if you've seen a Casey in your search is that are women being treated differently when it comes to uh, being charged for domestic violence? You pointed this one out when a woman was trying to turn in a gun to keep herself safe, she was the one that got arrested. And she ended up staying in jail for a long period of time. And I was just kind of stunned in light of all this jail and bail reform 
I'm seeing a lot of women who are being incarcerated. So pay attention to that as you go forward. We're also realizing that pretrial services can play an important role. We saw a nice article that came out about when pretrial services were involved, there was less recidivism. So obviously we have to think of new strategies, new friendships, and continue to sound the alarm. We're now uh, tracking articles that are finally coming out from advocates, police officers, and even judges who are very concerned about the public safety. And our focus in prosecution, as I mentioned, is how do you build that case? How do you enhance victim safety and offender accountability? Uh, we feel very strongly that cases can be built with allowing the victim to not testify or choose to not testify. The whole journey around forfeiture by wrongdoing that prosecutors on this call are familiar with. And if you're not familiar with it, you need to go to our resource library, listen to the webinars, go to Equitas' website, the OBWTA provider for prosecutors' resources, and listen to their webinars on forfeiture by wrongdoing. The bottom line is that when a perpetrator of strangulation assault intimidates his victim into not testifying against him, that case becomes more provable, not less. You just have to find the intimidation. And uh, this is a quiz. What percentage of domestic violence strangulation cases involve intimidation? The answer, 100%. So we know that 100% of perpetrators are intimidating their victims. All we have to do is find that evidence because you forfeit your right to confront and cross-examine witnesses against you when you have intimidated them and terrified them into not coming to court to testify against you. And we're beginning to see cases come out uh, we did a webinar in 2019 uh, that Gail facilitated with the prosecution team from Virginia uh, that worked on the Cody case. Uh, they came and presented at the National Advocacy Center for the U.S. Department of Justice with us in Columbia, South Carolina, just a couple of months ago. A very powerful case where the victim was repeatedly called from jail. He intimidated her. It started with, oh, baby, oh, baby, I love you. And it ended pretty much with, if you don't, if you don't hire a lawyer and take the fifth, you're going to answer for it. And they used that information uh, to go forward with the case without the victim's testimony and convicted him of felony domestic violence strangulation assault because of the incredible work of a dispatcher well-trained, a forensic nurse well-trained, uh, and police officers well-trained. So we are continuing to push that. Prosecutors need dispatchers to be well-trained and do their job well. It's all part of building uh, cases in all of this. The great news as we uh, finish up talking about prosecution and move toward advocacy before we wrap up uh, is that cases are coming out right and left, both published and unpublished. Published cases are obviously precedent in that state and persuasive in others. Unpublished cases can be used persuasively virtually anywhere in the country. Uh, and we're seeing lots of things come out in case law, body cam, a video being admissible. A dance part of the IACP team on this, and that body cam is vital uh, in these cases. So we're a big fan of body cams. Expert testimony is coming in across the country. Uh, it's amazing how expert testimony from people who have been to our courses and are then testifying in court is being allowed uh, all over the United States. Uh, we're seeing everything from multiple strangulation charges being upheld to even a torture charge in California in a case that Bill Smock testified in uh, that the Riverside County DA's office went forward on. This was a case we touched on earlier when we talked about brain atrophy. The victim in that case had experienced brain atrophy uh, and there just, it just so happened there was an MRI before and after the assault that actually showed the atrophy from a recorded 22 minute assault. Um, so that piece is a new conversation for us, beginning to think about how truly uh, terrifying it is to be in that situation. Bill analogized it to waterboarding, and certainly uh, that is a fair analogy because waterboarding is a terrifying experience where uh, suspects in interrogations feel like they're drowning, uh, and that's very similar to uh, the strangulation assault. We love the fact that prosecutors are getting more creative for, for police officers that do know about lateral vascular neck restraints that have been trained in the carotid restraint. We're now using those officers to educate juries about it and why they used it, how scary it was to be used on them, why they tapped out 
Um, and every prosecutor in America can use the argument that victims don't get to tap out. And if we uh, continue to use the benefit of martial arts experts, of uh, law enforcement trainers, certainly that is a great uh, benefit to us. Uh, we're also seeing that it doesn't take very long to commit the crime, 1001, 1002. We have a published case out of New York. Yeah, we have this new case out of Indiana. The bottom line is this doesn't take four minutes for the crime to be committed. Yes, and so this is all good news for us, and it leads up to, I'm hoping that the next one is the Holy Cow case. The Holy Cow through. case is coming. Uh, but the bottom line is that we are beginning to see cases all over the country where courts are siding with us. Uh, this one in particular was interesting. Uh, the, the victim was, uh, was the charged one in the crime, and defense wanted to raise battered woman syndrome. Uh, the judge wouldn't even let the jury be more dire, more dire on it. The victim was convicted and sentenced to prison, and it went up on appeal, and it was reversed because the appellate court said, of course, uh, she had the right to raise battered woman syndrome defense. And this is how victims react in a strangulation situation where they may have no other choice if the system has failed them, but to ultimately use a gun to kill their offender. Um, even in those kinds of cases, it's significant to talk about. And yes, we are we are advocating for and finding that there are more and more strangulation cases that at the end of the day really are attempted murder. Uh, we, Gail loves a case out of New Orleans that is a great testimony to the incredible work that's happened in New Orleans post-Katrina with the creation of the Family Justice Center, aggressive training of law enforcement, specialized detectives being housed in the New Orleans Family Justice Center, uh, specialized forensic nurses now working these cases, trained dispatchers, and even though New Orleans continues to have challenges and obviously uh, challenges with the prioritization of these cases in the district attorney's office, uh, State versus Diaz is a great case. I was honored to get to meet the judge that presided over this case while I was training judges uh, in New Orleans a few months ago. And it is a great example of how a felony case can turn into an attempted uh, murder or manslaughter case without the testimony of the victim ever being necessary uh, in a court of law. So we're continuing to see uh, these kind of trends develop. Uh, the cases on appeal are all coming out good for us, and we're seeing courts support this whole uh, approach and the kinds of people who can testify as experts, the expertise that people have after coming to our course. There's no jury or judge in America that knows what you know after you've been to our four-day course, particularly if you came uh, with a team. Uh, so we want to emphasize that. Gail touched on this whole rough sex defense. I do think that we're going to see more and more of this rough sex defense as strangulation is becoming more and more kind of normalized in social media and the culture and in pornography. But the bottom line is that we have to continue to take this, the position that you cannot consent to something that can kill you. Strangulation for sexual pleasure is like playing, playing Russian roulette. And Russian roulette is against the law. And the loser in a Russian roulette game goes to jail. And the loser in a strangulation rough sex case should go to jail as well. Uh, we also are doing a lot more work with Jim Henderson, who wasn't able to be on this call, uh, but Jim is a former probation officer uh, that has been working with Battered Women's Justice Project and is now working with us around offender accountability. Huge priority area. We're working on a chapter that Gail uh, and Jim and others are a part of, really looking at the role of probation and parole, because just like most of us didn't understand this, uh, probation and parole, does not they don't understand stranglers either. And they've all been thrown in the same pot. Every domestic violence perpetrator kind of treated the same in probation and parole, and they are not the same as we've talked uh, so much about uh, in this journey. So continuing to push for specialization around probation and parole and understanding the challenges and figuring out that the criminal justice system is not going to solve all this. We've got to have both formal and informal mechanisms. Uh, Don McPherson, who's done a lot of work around the role of men and addressing men's violence, is going to be speaking at our conference in May of 2020 in San Diego with Jim Henderson and talking about this relationship between formal and informal uh, work. And Gail, you, you cited an uh, Idaho statute here uh, about attempted strangulation. Uh, yes. So what was added last year, uh, there 
strangulation law initially passed in 2005, which is really cool. It is probably one of the easiest uh, strangulation laws uh, that you can uh, prosecute, but you'll see in the last sentence, which unfortunately I think got messed up in the transition, it talks about adding a psyche valve for purposes of sentencing. So that's why you see here, and we'll give you a copy of the entire statute, but Idaho is the very first state to even address strangulation at sentencing. So it's just something to take a look at. The other things that we feel are important as we continue to move forward is diversion. We have seen in 2019 too many cases of stranglers where the case was diverted. We also think it's important to add a factual statement from offenders. You have the opportunity to sometimes enter into plea bargains, but having them admit early on exactly what they did is important. We also think now that we're learning more about long-term consequences is we all need to pay more attention to restitution. And I think as we unravel sort of the whole sentencing and probation, uh, as we are sentencing offenders, much like we've done in DUI and other cases, is that we need to have them sign an advisal that they know that this is dangerous and serious and can cause long-term consequences. So if they do it again, intent is not going to be an issue. So that's why we included that piece. We also, as we're wrapping up now, talking about advocacy, I'm just going to highlight a couple of key points that you can take a look at later. Uh, to make this easy for everyone, I went back through our materials and we have identified 10 top tips that I think all of us can consider when we're trying to help a victim who's been strangled. It goes all the way from educating yourself to helping others understand this and then also integrating ACEs and HOPE into your work. When you have a little more time, you can take a look at each and every one. We're gonna be doing a number of webinars just on advocacy that'll be coming up this month. We're doing one with the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. So you'll see this particular uh, presentation about the top 10 tips there. We also wanna encourage everybody to take a look at our victim brochures. Education, education, education is important. And we're going to customize these brochures for you for free as part of our work with OVW. This last year, 48 different communities took us up on our offer. And now we're at 135 communities across the United States and around the world that are getting these brochures out to survivors. This is how you do it. All you got to do is email us. Give us your high resolution logo, your contact information that you want on that particular brochure. And our team and right now is Fernanda, who's taking the heavy lifting on this. She can usually get it back to you within 24 hours. That's right, friends, 24 hours. And you're gonna have a really cool brochure filled with a lot of information that could save a victim's life. The other thing is that we have partnered with our friends in Ohio. The Ohio Domestic Violence Network has come up with amazing resources for the victim who's going through a traumatic brain injury no need to reinvent the wheel go to their website download the materials or go to our website we also have it posted there and for those of you who've attended our trainings before they are now included in our drop box which is the last warning shot which you should all have and we keep updating that drop box for you one of my favorite articles of all time when it comes to victims especially victims who recant Please read this article. This is a must. This is required reading for all of us. Meet me at the hill where we used to park, where researchers from Ohio analyzed jail calls. And what they discovered is that there's a method to recantation. You can guarantee that it's going to happen. They analyzed it to such a level that they came up with the recantation reel and the five stages of what happens. And interesting enough, when you read the Cody case, there were five phone calls that the strangler made to the victim, and she completely recanted by the fifth phone call. She experienced five stages and five phone calls. So you'll see the connection when you read the Cody case and you read this article. We also believe in using the risk assessment tools, and a lot has happened here. Casey, this one's really yours. You had a lot of conversations with Jackie. Well, I think most of you that use the danger assessment tool know this, but there was a new update in 2019, and uh, Jackie and her team actually added weighting to uh, prior strangulation assault. They also emphasized the importance of dialogue with the survivor when you're asking questions on the DA. It shouldn't just be, you know, did you, were you strangled? Did we try to choke you or cut off your breathing? 
that should not be uh, what's happening. It should be a dialogue if the answer is yes to any of those questions. And obviously there has to be uh, then medical follow-up, uh, forensic examination, uh, additional assistance, particularly if, uh, if there's been prior uh, information about it. And Jimmy Geiger Crisis Center, they've done a lot of work and really creating a tool for law enforcement. And also this particular tool, the DA law enforcement, <laughs> can be a tool that we can use for bail. So we wanted you to be aware of that. We've been following some of the research that has been done. And we also wanted to share with you some of the recent results that came out of Ohio. As you can see, there's a thing here. Ohio has got it together. What they found by using the DA-11, which is meant for law enforcement, is most of the victims who were strangled were at high risk. Most of those high risk victims were threatened with murder and they believed their abuser was capable of killing them. So a good tool to analyze as we continue to improve our work. We also like the danger assessment tool number five. It was designed for the medical community and triage. Five really important questions that you can ask. And one of the things that my law student found is what could we do when it comes to safety planning with the most high risk victims? And we really like this one, the victim inventory of goals, options, and risks. We're gonna take a closer look at it because quite frankly, it looks like the science of hope was integrated into their safety plan. And as Great. we wrap up now, Gail, you got five minutes. I could do it. Implementation and promising practices. So one of the things we wanted to highlight is how do you integrate this into your work? And we did see a lot of family justice centers doing that because they're kind of like already built for collaboration and implementation. So one of the key features we have seen is medical services and medical advocacy at family justice centers. Just wanted to give a shout out. Uh, probably my two favorite things that happened this year was expanding the forensic medical unit to the health clinic. So New Orleans has a Hope Health Clinic, full medical services, forensics, you name it, they're doing it there. And also congratulations to Rose and the Family Justice Center. They also opened up a health clinic for victims at their center. So these are the first two that are really taking um, into These guidelines will and augment. And we just wanted to acknowledge the great work and the key and where is this is the first, let me say this again, this is the first poster that we know of that is really meant to be in the hospital, in the uh, doctor's office to talk about strangulation with your doctor, Michelle Shores and her whole team. They have a nice CARES approach. Health is about domestic violence. We have a six week webinar series. How cool would this be if all of you just watch this or create your own in your local community? And then Casey, it's up to you now to bring it home. Well, thank you friends for joining us. For those of you that have been part of all three uh, of these webinars, uh, we're sorry and thank you. Uh, it's, uh, it's a long journey to share all that we're learning, all that we're envisioning and all that we yet have to do. The last piece that's probably an appropriate place to end is uh, how we have integrated adverse childhood experiences work and our research around hope uh, into not just our organization, but into the Training Institute on Strangulation Prevention, into all of our courses. We think it points the way forward uh, for many of you. Uh, Dr. Chan Hellman and I wrote a book last year called Hope Rising, How the Science of Hope Can Change Your Life that has been getting traction everywhere. It's uh, the top of the bestseller list in Oklahoma right now, uh, and it's getting a lot of interest around the country as we have challenged people to think about hope and well-being, hope and resiliency and well-being. The way that survivors get robbed of hope, especially strangulation assault survivors, there is not a higher suicide rate or suicidal ideation rate in domestic violence uh, beyond strangulation. strangulation robs people of the ability to even think about having a future, let alone be able to navigate through it. So restoring hope in the lives of strangulation survivors and understanding the range of perpetrators has to be part of all this. Uh, Gail and I just published an article, a peer-reviewed article in the Domestic Violence Report uh, called Robbed of Hope that is really about this relationship between suicide uh, and strangulation and the reality that so many domestic violence victims become suicidal or actually commit suicide after having experienced traumatic brain injury and very often 
near or non-fatal strangulation assault. Uh, we as prosecutors actually prosecuted batterers after victims killed themselves many, many years ago. Both of us had cases where we went after the perpetrator, even after the victim uh, had finally taken the last uh, kind of thing she could do under control, which was to take her life to get away from the pain and the terror of it all. Uh, but this, for us, continues to be a focus area, understanding how to rebuild hope in the lives of survivors. It's hard to believe that after you survive strangulation, you can then want to kill yourself because you've just survived the worst thing that could possibly happen to you. Uh, and yet, uh, now you're suicidal. But that's all about our research around trauma uh, and hope. So we have a webinar on it that's available to all of you uh, on, in our resource library. Uh, we, have, we are now weaving it into our courses. Uh, I have a presentation uh, that amazing man uh, who did a great deal of work uh, running what's called the City Club in Denver and San Diego, who just recently passed away, George Mitrovich, uh, had uh, hosted a session for me that is videotaped and available on YouTube as well, where I walk you through this and its relationship to both perpetrators and the survivors. Um, and we have a website. If you even want to understand how it is that we're measuring hope in people's lives, you can measure your hope score for free at hopescore.com. Um, that's available uh, to many of you. Uh, that's as well. available. The message of all of you. That's appropriate wrap up. The message of all this was an appropriate wrap up. Lessons uh, learned about strangulation and assault is that hope heals trauma, and uh, destiny is is not decided in this. You grow up in a home with violence and abuse and have a high ACE score. It doesn't mean, one, that you have to become a perpetrator for life, and it doesn't mean you have to become a victim for life, that there are pathways to break that cycle. So as we wrap up, our challenge to each of you uh, on these webinars is keep setting goals. Hope is all about the ability to point toward the future, what you want to do, who you want to be, and how you're going to get there. And that is our challenge to you. What are your goals in 2020 to make a difference in the lives of survivors? to make a difference in your agency, to make a difference in the way your community handles this. We do have self-assessment tools available on our resource library for how communities can respond. And this is a great opportunity to give yourself a grade, look back and say, I heard Dan Rincon say this, I heard Diana Fagno say this, I heard Bill Smock or Gail Strack say this, how are we doing? Are we doing this? What do we need to address? What can we change? Do we need to go after the guns? Do we need to have a strangulation protocol? It's time, and we want to challenge you to learn from some of our lessons and, of course, to share your lessons. So even as we're wrapping up the presentation, we're still going to have some time for questions. If you want to send us questions, uh, we're happy to answer them and dialogue uh, as this webinar concludes. Uh, but we do want to, again, highlight our conference sponsored both by the Office for Victims of Crime, the Office on Violence Against Women in the U.S. Department of Justice, uh, Verizon, and a whole variety of other sponsors that are supporting our 20th annual uh, Family Justice Center conference called Living a Legacy of Hope uh, in San Diego in May. And we'd love to have you uh, register and join us. You can get information at allianceforhope.com or at familyjusticecenter.com or .org. Uh, and we will look forward to having you consider that. Our conference, as I mentioned, uh, in another part of these webinars, does have a whole track series on near and non-fatal strangulation cases that will be available at the conference. And most folks that come to our conference uh, come in teams. We also, as you can see, have a crazy busy 2020 traveling all over the country, uh, providing trainings, and very often people we particularly are finding survivors showing up at our trainings around the country to get information or family members wanting to get information. Very often, if uh, you go to our website and see that training, we don't run all of those trainings. We're just providing the training, so you'd have to contact local sites if you might want to attend one of our trainings around the country and see if they're willing to let you attend, uh, but you are more than welcome to do that. As Gail mentioned, we have webinars coming up in 2020. Uh, that focus on all of the dynamics, what we're learning and where we need to go with all of this. We're particularly excited about partnering with Ruth Glenn and the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence in a variety of ways. Ruth will also be uh, sharing a keynote with me uh, at our conference in May on the future of the domestic violence movement in America and where it's going. Because to be a movement, you actually have to move. 
Uh, and so there's lots of thinking going on around what it means to have a movement, uh, particularly around domestic violence, but in, including sexual assault and uh, near and non-fatal strangulation. Our next master's course, which is our three-day course after our four-day course, you have to have graduated from our four-day course to be able to attend our master's course will be in August of 2020. Uh, and uh, uh, registration will be available for that. It's an application process. It's a competitive process to attend our master's course, but uh, stay tuned for that at strangulationtraininginstitute.com or .org uh, because that will be uh, posting shortly. The master's course takes it to the next level. Um, it goes beyond. It's a lot of strategic thinking together. It's not so much didactic training as it is interactive learning and peer learning uh, that Everybody attending that course is really an expert. And so it's the experts training the experts and working together. And one of the most significant things that we do, thanks to uh, support from OBW. So I'm gonna go ahead and wrap up. If you have questions, feel free to text them in uh, to our platform so that we can answer them. If you're not on our mailing list and you don't receive notifications about our webinars, our conferences, uh, all that we're doing in all of our programs at Alliance for Hope International, uh, you can simply pull out your cell phone uh, and as if it was the phone number, type in 22828, and then in the text box, put in Hope Giver. Uh, we have a, a kind of a double opt-out program with our constant contact list, so you'll then be given the opportunity to provide an email address. You'll confirm that. Uh, we don't sell it. We don't use it for anything but to provide information on OBC and OBW uh, sponsored events and programs of the Alliance uh, that provide support uh, and training to all of those uh, working in fields of sexual and domestic violence, child abuse, elder abuse, and human trafficking. So blessings on all of you. We so appreciate um, your willingness uh, to join us. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bill Smock, for being part of this. Uh, we appreciate you more than we can express in words. Uh, you are uh, a key medical leader for us, and we couldn't have done any of this without you over the last few years, particularly after Dean Hawley's retirement you filled a gap that no one else in America was able to fill for us. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Casey. And thank you, Dan and Diana. We love you both and appreciate you. Diana, we love the vision for the Academy of Forensic Nursing. Dan, thank you for laboring in the trenches of law enforcement for so many years on this, for being part of the team in Maricopa that has now set a standard that challenges America. So uh, Dan and Diana, thanks both for being with us. Thanks much. It's, it's an honor. And uh, this is uh, it's a piece of artwork that's actually on the wall in the lobby of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Police Department in North Carolina uh, that Gail and I saw a number of years ago and we're so touched by it. with all of the challenges that have faced law enforcement in recent years and in many ways kind of the attack on law enforcement. Uh, just an incredible reminder that uh, yes, there are law enforcement officers that make mistakes and do things they shouldn't do, but a law enforcement plays such a critical role in giving hope uh, to children and to adults in need. Uh, they stand in the gap when the guns are uh, going off, uh, they run toward that gunfire. And so uh, we do believe not just law enforcement, but prosecutors and advocates and forensic nurses and doctors and mental health professionals and parole and probation, you're all hope givers. Um, you're, whether you're an advocate, whether you're a police officer, you're there to give hope. So as we wrap up, just a reminder, you cannot give what you do not have. So our challenge to you is take care of yourself in this journey. Um, make sure that hope stays alive in your life so that you can be able to provide it to others in moments when they don't have it themselves and they need you. Thank you all. Thank you to OBW for supporting uh, all the work that we're doing in, in domestic violence and in near and non-fatal strangulation assault. Thank you uh, to OBC for the support that they've given us and all the work we've done around poly victimization and really thinking about trauma-informed care and the power of hope and resiliency in family justice centers. Uh, we're honored to be able to do this work and constantly humbled by all that we yet have to learn. So I'm Casey Gwynn, the President of Alliance for Hope International. On behalf of Gail and Dan and Bill and Diana, uh, thank you for joining us today. Thank you all so much for joining today's webinar. We will now begin the Q&A portion of today's webinar with our panelists.
Well, hello, friends. Oh. It's time for questions. And looks like so far we only have one question, which I can answer myself and certainly invite uh, Dan and Dr. Bill Smock to share their um, feedback. But the question that we have is why aren't we prosecuting strangulation cases as an attempted murder? Well, it's a very good question. We definitely are advocating for police and prosecutors to evaluate their cases uh, involving strangulation, not only as a felony, but as attempted murder. We are also keeping track of all of the cases that are published or unpublished that have to do with strangulation being charged as attempted murder. Uh, we believe that strangulation should be charged as attempted murder anytime you have urination, defecation, if you have a ligature that's being used, but what you're gonna be looking for is the intent, were there any threats made, what type of pressure was applied, was it applied multiple times, any evidence of premeditation, the ability to let go, and I think when you wrap all things together, there really is no reason to apply pressure to somebody's neck, period. But certainly there is no reason to continue to apply pressure, especially after someone has already passed out. Uh, it's going to be a matter of your jurisdiction. Has your police law enforcement been trained in strangulation if they've been trained they're being trained to assess the difference between attempted murder felony and a misdemeanor and then also the same question applies to your prosecutor and prosecutors are also going to look to their case law but i agree with you uh, we should be considering it in fact we received a recent news clip from a judge in wyoming and in the headlines of the news, he said strangulation is attempted murder. Um, and so I think little by little, we're getting that message across. So having said that, uh, Dr. Bill Smock or Dan, do you wanna add anything to that question and or response? Okay. For some reason, uh, they are not jumping in right now. Since we did not receive any additional questions, I will just thank you for joining us. We really appreciate your uh, brand of determination. We initially started this webinar thinking it was going to be two hours. And as you know, uh, one webinar turned into a second. And at our second webinar, we realized we had enough information here to share in three webinars. So we are done with the updates. We're now getting ready for future webinars. Our next one will be the forensic nurse as an expert witness. Thank you all for pushing the envelope and fighting for victims of domestic violence, sexual assault, child abuse, elder abuse, and human trafficking. Uh, we join you in this work and we share your passion. Bye friends and thank you Carly, Emma, and Trish for helping everything go so smoothly. Webinar is now over.